Thank you, Krista, for that beautiful prelude. And good morning. Welcome to worship service at University Mennonite Church. Rooted in the love of Christ, we welcome each one here today. We welcome your mind, your body, and spirit. We welcome your faith and your doubts, your joys and your sorrows. Wherever you come from, whatever your age and whomever you love, whoever you are, we welcome you. Let us pray. Holy God, you call us together to reflect on your word and our life in your world. Be with us now as we sing and pray together that we may hear your voice and understand your way. This we pray through Jesus the Christ, amen. In our uh, call to worship today, uh, we all start off and uh, then now we'll respond with uh, uh, basically the rest of the sentence. And uh, this is, uh, well, I guess it's in your bulletin. So let's start. Come, Holy Spirit, enter our silences. Come, Holy Spirit, into the depths of our longing. Come, Holy Spirit, unmask our pretending. Enter our trusting, enter our fearing. Enter our letting go, enter our holding back. Come, Holy Spirit, embrace and free us. So now we'll have our uh, two hymns, and Jim's going to lead, and uh, Krista will be accompanying. Please turn to number 797, and let's stand, please, if you're able. We are people of God's peace.
705, for the healing of the nation. That last song was fitting for our lighting of the peace lamp. And as we light the peace lamp, we pray, loving God, we pray for the people in places of war and conflict, for all those suffering or afraid, that you will be close to them and protect them. We pray for world leaders, that compassion, strength, and wisdom would guide their choices. We pray for the world that we may reach out in solidarity to our brothers and sisters in need. May we walk in your ways so that peace and justice become a reality for all the world. Amen. Okay. Jim, could you get us started on our, um, as, as we're journeying through Genesis, we have adopted this little song before each scripture reading. Number 405, and we're going to sing through it twice. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, today, Abram is on the road again. We've uh, been following some of uh, Abram's travels. He started out, what was it, southeastern Iraq, current southeastern Iraq, Ur of the Chaldees, and he and a pretty extended family head on up the river valleys to Haran, I think it was, uh, northwestern Iraq, maybe Turkey, hung out there for a while, and then God said, Abram, time to move on to Canaan, and then he went on down, I believe that was last week's scripture, uh, to um, uh, what's now Israel and, and the West Bank uh, uh, between Bethel and Ai. And after a while, uh, there was a, a famine, and he and his extended family head off to Egypt for an eventful stay, and I will summarize that just to say that he prospered uh, uh, financially and, and economically. But after a while, it was time for him to leave Egypt, and that's where we begin Genesis, uh, the 13th chapter. And, aha, uh -huh, we have that. Yes, great. And we have the map up to... The map is an indulgence to all of those who are like me. When we hear these strange place names, we wonder, where is it? So this is just a, a little guide for you. And we're going to start out in Egypt. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. He journeyed on by stages from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first and where Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, and the land could not support both of them living together because their possessions were so great that they could not live together. Thus strife broke out between the herders of Abram's livestock and the herders of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites lived in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herders and my herders, for we are kindred. Is, it not, is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will take the right. And if you take the right hand, I will go to the left. Lot looked about him and saw that the plain of Jordan was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. Now, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward, eastward, plain of Jordan, and they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the plain and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, raise your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. Rise up, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. Now we have children's time. So, and I believe Marvin's going to lead that, and we're going to start off a little song. Go ahead.
fun here anyway. Okay? Now, did any of you listen to the scripture that was just read? Yes. You listened to it? Did you understand it all? Yeah, yeah. I'm like that too. I don't understand words so well. I like pictures better. Okay? So, this guy named Abram and Lot were living together and then they had to separate. Okay, that's the gist of what I got. But let's figure out why they had to separate, okay? And to help with that, I've got another picture for us, okay? So, this piece of paper represents one acre, all right? One acre. How much is an acre? Uh, 43,560 square feet, right? Isn't that what you were thinking? Thanks, Mike. This is a picture of. Okay. Maybe I'll put it that way. Okay. What is that a picture of? The church, you think that's the church? What that's what? Oh, that's the playground. And the solar panels. And here's that little curved driveway that comes in front. So this, if we took all the property of the church all the way from this road that's up here and the road that's in the parking lot here, and the road that goes out here, all the property of the church, and we put it in an acre, it would only be about that much of an acre. What? So if you took two of those, if that was there, and this was down here, so an acre is about twice the size of our property of our church, okay? So that's one acre. Now, if that acre was growing grass, how many animals do you think could live on it? Um, 1,000 what? Okay, all right, let's, let's figure, what's this thing? A cow. How many cows do you think could live on one acre? 30 cows on an acre. 15. Let's see how many, yeah? 20? How about that? One half a cow on an acre. So if you had a whole cow, you'd have to have two of these acres to feed that whole cow, have enough grass to feed that whole cow, okay? Now, what about sheep? How many sheep do you think you'd have on an acre? Nine? Thirty? And you saw through this, didn't you? Yeah, I saw you did. Okay, so if we had sheep, we could have five sheep on an acre, but we couldn't keep the cow there. Because if the cow was there, that, there wouldn't be enough for the animals to eat, and they wouldn't gain weight, and they'd be sickly, okay? Now, what if you didn't have sheep, but you had goats? How many goats do you think could be in an acre? You didn't count it right. You're looking, but you didn't even count right. Oh, seven, okay, seven. So we have to get rid of the sheep, and if we had goats, we could have... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven goats. So an acre will feed seven goats. Okay, so you got these numbers down? Now, Abram and Lot, these were these guys traveling around together. And one tent. And one tent, okay. And they had to live on this land, and they got into a, a problem. And let's think about what the problem would be. So we've got, he's got all these animals. Lot and Abram have all these animals. And then Lot... There's one tent, that's Abram's tent, okay? Oh, there is two tents, okay? So let's put another one. Who would live in this one? Lot, Lot correct, okay, so Lot's over here. Now these tents take up some of this acre, right? Whoop, the house just fell down, it's tent. There it is, okay. So tents take up some of the acre. So now we've got these, still these animals. Oh wait, Lot and Abram, Abram were blessed by God, which means God gave them all sorts of children, and all those children had more children. And what do you think about the tent size? Yeah, they had to either make them bigger tents, or they had to make additional tents, right? So here are some extra tents. Uh, that's for all the Lot's kids and grandkids. And here's Abram's kids and grandkids. Now look, there's, oh, I think I got one There are now less and less ground for the animals to eat on, right? So what if you had five sheep on there, but suddenly this space was taken up with tents? The sheep, 
they, they could eat in between the tents, but they'd still have not enough to eat, so they'd have to go hungry, okay? Now, you think that's enough space? Sorry, it's not. Now, they would, so, so, okay, we'd have to get rid of one of the sheep, right? So one of the sheep would have to sell it, but they didn't want to sell. And God blessed their animals, too, so the sheep had more sheep. And the goats had more goats. And the cows had more cows. So pretty soon, we not only had five sheep, we had all these goats, and we had some cows, all on this little bit of land. And what do you think is going to happen? They're going to at least lose a lot of weight, aren't they? Okay, they may not die, but they'll lose a lot of weight. So Abram came up with a solution. And in the text today, Abram said to Lot, Hey, look, we're overcrowded. Our people herding our sheep and our goats and our cows are fighting with each other because they don't have enough land and the cows are going hungry and the sheep are going hungry and they don't know what to do. And they're all upset. And Abram said, hey, look, Lot, there's a lot of space here. Let's divide this up. You either go to the right and I will go to the left or you go to the left and I'll go to the right. We'll just divide it up. So that's what they decided to do. They split their ways, went different ways, and then they had lots of land for their animals and their tents so they could all live happy, okay? Now, what's the take home on this? What's that? Well, it would still, it would still take up some space, okay? And these are big tents, they're big families, okay? So what's the take home, do you think? The take home, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. What is the moral of the story? You know that one? Yeah. When you have conflicts with someone like Abram and Lot, they were having, the herdsmen were having fight, and Abram said, rather than us fighting, let's just divide up. So if you're with your friends in your house, and suddenly they want to play with some toys that you don't want to, you want to play with too, and neither one of you can play, both of you can't play at the same time, you can always say, look, you take it and play with this one, I'll play with this one for a while. Or if you've got brothers and sisters, and you're a little cramped for space in the playroom, say, hey, look, you go ahead and stay in the playroom. I'll go to my bedroom and play. And you avoid conflict by compromising. No, okay, if you don't have a bedroom, go to the living room. Go to the kitchen and play, okay? So you can always split and keep things happy, okay? All right, thank you very much for coming. And remember about Abram and Lot and how they had way too many animals and kids for that little bit of land, okay? All right, you can go back now. It's always tough to follow you, Marvin. <laughs> good morning, friends. It's good to be here, worshiping again here this morning. And our journey through Genesis continues today with the story of Abram and Lot. Let's just recap a little bit here on the fall. Ross did a little bit of this already. Uh, so far, we've explored an overview of the book of Genesis and creation story with Rabbi Ostrich. We talked about the stories of Adam and Eve. We had a church around the table where we talked about Noah and the flood. And last week, we talked about God calling Abram and Sarai. We've been reminded on this journey of the complexity of this ancient text. That Genesis is messy at times. Perhaps best not understood as a, as a historic or a scientific document. But we've also come to discover the beauty of this text. That invites us, as Rabbi Ostrich said, to wrestle with the stories in its pages. To uncover deeper truths about things like covenant relationships seeking to follow God even when we mess up. The weightiness of being part of the people of God who've been blessed to be a blessing. Now last week after our service, Karen Rath led the adults in a conversation in which we talked about our feelings so far in the book of Genesis. We explored some of those tensions that we feel in this text and admitted to each other that despite spending time with these stories, it leaves us still with more questions. We wonder how we might interpret these ancient stories. And we admit to ourselves that there are parts that we still find really difficult, or even we do not like. It should be no surprise, of course, then, that while trying to figure out a sermon for this passage, 
I had myself feeling I, I was going in all these different directions and that multiple sermons could really be written. We have a passage in front of us this morning that includes the following, and I'll put up our map again just as a, refre- a refresher. That first arrow is Abram and Lot and their families leaving Egypt, a place that got Abram embroiled in political scandal, mixed messages, and confusion. Yet this experience somehow results in him leaving with wealth and resources. That second arrow is Abram traveling through the Negev desert with Lot and returning to the place where God first spoke to him. This land, once thought to be fertile and plentiful, turns out to be insufficient for Lot and Abram's growing families and resources, as Marvin just outlined in our children's time. And so Abram proposes a separation, hoping that that will create peace. And guess what? Lot jumps at the chance to go their separate ways. God gives a new promise to Abram that his offspring will be more numerous than the grains of sand spreading out in all directions to the north, the south, the east, and the west. I found myself wondering, is this a story about family conflict? Is this a story about peace at all costs? Is it a story about land use and wealth? Maybe it's one about sustainability and security. And then, of course, I thought about our fall election season, and I could feel myself writing messages that felt like they were taking partisan sides. I found myself thinking, what might an elephant sermon look like? A noble beast that appreciates traditional values and sure-footedness. What might an elephant think about this passage? So let me put on my symbolic red tie. See what we can do here for an elephant sermon. Elephant sermon, I think, if I'm looking at this passage properly, is going to focus on Lot. It's going to focus on how Lot should have taken ownership in the squabbles with his uncle. Rather than taking the offer to separate, Lot should have known that family values are more important than anything else. He should have fought to maintain those family relationships. So deeply important in that ancient Near Eastern society. Lot should have humbled himself to his uncle's direction. Rather than being pompous enough to think that he had it all figured out, he should have let his uncle choose the path. Maybe he should have offered his own wealth to help offset some of these tensions. Perhaps proposing that they hire more laborers or extend their family land even further, but to continue to remain connected. And if the decision down the road needed to happen that he should separate, to leave knowing that he had put his hard work and determination on the table, and it was enough to stand on his own. If Lot had the sensibility of an elephant, he would have realized that nothing is more important than family ties and maintaining that connection. All right, that's one way to take a side. Let me put on my symbolic blue tie next. Let's see here. Uh, what's the donkey sermon going to look like? Let's take a look. Donkey is a determined beast, right? It's a beast that appreciates a good forward momentum, progress. Perhaps the donkey sermon might focus instead on Abram or Abraham. Think about Abram being this humble person, offering choice in the midst of tension. Rather than holding his nephew to ancient standards of family structures, he gracefully offers separation. He offers it as a way to save the family relationship. He has the foresight to pause and remember that there were failings in his past. And perhaps using that wisdom, he might offer a new course of action. Perhaps there's a message here even about sharing wealth rather than controlling wealth being more sustainable than hoarding it all in one place. If Abram had acted any other way, he probably would have destroyed the family, destroyed the fabric of their family unit. If our current political context has taught us anything, though, it's that hardline partisan stances, even hardline sermons, 
don't often help us find the way. So I'm going to take off the blue tie as well. Leave these here for now. I then found myself thinking about Bethany's beautiful church around the table reflection, about the covenant relationships found in the Noah story. That particular Sunday, our church around the table group, which includes uh, the McCormick family and the Byes family, we talked a lot that Sunday, um, fascinated with this story for a variety of reasons. The children in our group were curious and skeptical about a global flood. They were bothered by the absolute destruction of humanity, noting that no human being that they know of anyway is either entirely good or entirely evil. We talked about the many different ways that rainbows make us feel. We talked about this piece of this conversation that has stuck with me the most since then, that relationships are built around covenant and commitment. And our group was really curious about how we know, not so much how we know to stay together, but how we know when that covenant gets messed up and it's time to separate. Our group wondered how God's promise to never destroy the earth with a flood might feel for those who are suffering from flooding. Hit me again this week with the news of Helene making landfall, these horrible pictures from many of our states. How's it gonna feel for those folks in the aftermath as they clean up their destroyed towns and homes? How are they gonna hear the Noah story in the aftermath of that tragedy? Abram and Lot, they're also in a covenant relationship of sorts. The age of 75, Abram leads his homeland, bringing his nephew Lot with him. Genesis doesn't tell us why Lot had to go along, why he was chosen to accompany his uncle, but he becomes part of the journey. It's an epic journey, especially in a moment in time without our modern transportation. Lot is along for the ride during the famine. He's along when Abram takes his complicated journey through Egypt and through the building of family wealth. He's there again when they return to the promised land. They're with each other through thick and thin. And yet when conflict arises, they go their separate ways. We know that religious history is filled with moments of separation and new identity. Jesus' mostly Jewish followers separate and become the early Christian church. The establishment of that early church leads to structures, church leaders disagreeing over theological stances, separating and forming their own branches and sects along the way. Our peace church tradition is the product of separation, right? Came out of the Reformation. And Anabaptists were not content enough with the reforming that the Protestants were doing, wanting to go even further. Even moments when our denominational traditions have merged as when the General Conference Mennonites merged with the old Mennonite church right around the year 2000, we decided instead during that merger to separate. We decided to divide along the borderline and there was a new formation of Mennonite Church Canada and Mennonite Church USA. And in the 20 years since then, 20 plus years now, we've watched many of our siblings in Christ choosing to separate from these newly formed denominations over our ongoing theological differences. It seems inevitable in some ways that covenant relationships are bound and determined to eventually break apart. Yet we also have countless examples when we've urged one another to hold on to relationships in difficult times. With the recent news that Mosaic Mennonite Conference has decided to step away, they are trying somehow to remain in relationship with Mennonite Church USA. I find myself wishing they would stick around. It feels more important to stay and disagree. And yet, for some reason, it's also easier to just disengage. When it comes to marriages, for much of our Christian history, the church has urged couples to stay united, sometimes in the midst of horrible circumstances. We've believed that it's more important to stay connected than to break those covenants sometimes at the price of tolerating spousal abuse and mistreatment. We might wring our hands about how relationships now in our culture seem to have become disposable or upgradable, lamenting the good old days when a covenant or a commitment actually meant something, 
yet we also notice the new life that sometimes comes from moving beyond a broken or abusive relationship. Our current American politics, whew, the red and the blue, right? Pick a tie, claim that tie, hold on to that, entrench yourself. We choose a side. We search for what defines us rather than where we find common ground. Perhaps the crux of today's story isn't about who was in the right or which side was the right side or which pathway was the right one. Perhaps it isn't a story to sort out if this is more of a donkey sermon or an elephant sermon, but a reminder for us to pause and really discern with each other. Perhaps there's a third way to navigate this text. So I brought along a purple tie for that occasion. After wrestling with this text this week, I kept going back to the fact that the first part of the story and the end of the story both have altars. Abram arrives back in the promised land from Egypt and he visits the place where God initially spoke to him where he had built an altar. Our text says that when he returned there, he called on the name of the Lord. And then at the end of the chapter, after Lot has gone away, what does Abram do? He pauses again to build an altar. Kind of bookends this story quite nicely. An altar is not an impulsive thing. It takes time to collect the materials to build the intended shape. It takes time to figure out what might be the offering. It takes time to ceremoniously ignite something, to let it, to, to let it burn to allow the embers to grow cold. An altar is something with deep intention. So what message is in there for us? In the midst of this divided context, in the midst of our tense moments, to pause enough to build an altar. Perhaps not a literal one. We don't usually burn things ceremoniously anymore, but sometimes we do. Perhaps we can build metaphorical altars that allow us to take a deep breath, to call out to God, to consider the pathway forward. Perhaps in these moments, Abraham feels nudges from God. Maybe that's where he felt this unique idea to let God, to let Lot choose the path forward. Perhaps in that space after Lot had gone his way, when he's feeling, ooh, did I make the right decision? It was at that altar where God provided him with comfort and peace that despite the separation, big things are still going to unfold. Perhaps this is what we hope to do right now at University Mennonite Church. As we pause enough to reflect on the themes from these ancient stories, as we work together on our visioning, to imagine who we might be as a congregation moving forward. Perhaps we're building an altar together as we seek God, as we seek the peace that comes from God. Friends, maybe we can offer these altar spaces to each other to intentionally pause a little bit more, to reflect, to speak out loud our prayers and concerns, to stop worrying about which tie we're wearing, but to consider where we go from here in that space. We move now into our sharing time. And I I like this idea that maybe our sharing time is an altar that we have continued to cultivate here at University Mennonite Church. To pause intentionally, to share with each other, to lift up the things that we are carrying. And so we'll begin our sharing time as we have for the last few weeks with our glimpses of joy pictures and videos, things that we've experienced in our weeks. And I hope that we can continue to find God as we pause and reflect with each other, as we create these altars and we share with each other. May God bless us as we continue our journey.
Our sharing time uh, is extended now into um, the vi a visioning moment. Uh, Leslie is going to share with us what the UMC visioning team has been working on for the last, uh, last little while. And uh, I'll turn it over to her. Well, I'm so happy to be here, um, you know, with the joy and the pain, because we're family. And I, I also want to thank uh, all of you for praying for me last week. Um, and, uh, yeah, I needed it. It was not good. <laughs> but here I am. So, what has the visioning team been doing? Or maybe another way to put it, is what has the visioning team been doing? I think that, um, you know, it's, it's, we've been meeting a, a quite a long time now, and as Laura explained, we had a number of things happen that um, slowed our progress, but this is something that, and some things that we've done. Our first focus was to uh, have a definition of vision. And for this church and we decided it must be clear passionate with a sense of our identity we looked for our identity with these questions <clears throat> who are we why are we here what do we believe where are we headed and how are we headed there to find our answers we ask you and 
uh, uh, the church? Why do I come to church? The strongest answer was to belong to a community. We even had a secret shopper come, a friend who is completely of no faith, who just came one Sunday to tell us what they saw about us. And, um, you know, with no prompting, <laughs> they saw things like the way we included our children, and they loved it. They heard about our social injustice work. They heard a prayer request for help, and they really believed that we were going to help. They loved the pictures of our members living throughout the week. And um, this is the little bit difficult part. They had been in this neighborhood many times before, but never noticed that we were here because they thought we were a community center, which is kind of funny because we kind of are. Um, we looked into our history and made the timeline of important events, and um, you added to that. We looked at the developmental stages of our church and when it might slide towards death. And we found out that, um, of course, death can happen to a church any time because of traumatic events. Um, but when it's most likely and a more common way to happen is when the church has reached maturity. And so it's not even quite noticed at first. But vision begins to wane. You know, maybe the initial vision has been accomplished, um, but th maybe the founders of the church are, and some of you would probably know about this, are getting tired. Um, but otherwise, the church can just start to become a management task. And a church dies when it has no clear, passionate sense of their identity, a vision. In mid-May this year, we broke up into small teams and imagined what we had learned um, from all these investigations and feedback. And we came up with a few new visions that were possibilities to seed in the church. Uh, the one that ended up sticking out the most um, was the intergenerational vision. Uh, it flowed from the fact that we had already begun this vision and we are committed to children being in the main church. And like uh, we saw so beautifully this morning, our um, Mr. Rogers and Mrs. Rogers sermons with the children up front and um, removing the pews in the back and so that parents can still be here with their little children. And um, currently I'm hearing that we're talking about reviving the mentoring program and um, I, I, I think that um, the mixed generation Sunday school is, I, I went to the first one, it was really fun. And to my mind, importantly, having young people have roles with real purpose in the church is something that is necessary for the life of the church. When I was uh, working at times as a family therapist, uh, the parents would always say, you know, with the children there, well, why won't you take any responsibility for the house? You know, why won't you even clean your room? Why won't you bring friends over? And invariably, the, um, the kids said the same thing, which is, this is not our home. It is your home. And I thought about that a lot. And in a lot of those situations, you know, what the parents were doing was saying, just get good grades and that's all you have to do. And, or, or other just very simple things. Nothing that gave the children real purpose or a sense of involvement in the home. Uh, so we don't need big gyms or huge summer programs. Our children are with us, learning their value with heart. And so I look forward to moving ahead. If the church wants it, we're going to get more feedback. But I love it. Um, look forward to at least having it evaluated that that be our strong vision, uh, intergenerational. Thank you.
Well, uh, thank you, Leslie, uh, for that, that summary, and, and thank you to the Visioning Committee for, for all the hard work that, that, that you're doing. And, uh, that's a, so, ni nice summary, intergenerational, I, I did, did hear. Okay, uh, so as we uh, wrap up to, this morning, uh, it's time for announcements. Any announcements that someone wants to make? Again, uh, just raise your hand, the microphone will come, and Gloria has one. This announcement is an ob observation. Hmm. We are all very comfortable that everyone up here except Leslie was a man this morning. And for those of you who are new and are looking for a congregation, women are very active in this church. <laughs> and so don't let you go away thinking, oh. <laughs> so I just want to clarify that uh, we do have women on the pulpit many Sundays. Amen, sister. <laughs> You're on break for just this Sunday. Uh, a month ago, I sent this out. So I'm going to send it out again, but uh, Doug will include it on the Thursday week, uh, the thing that he sends out. But uh, our Turkish friends here, Ahmet and, and Ennis, uh, and their families, you know, this mosaic workshop they're bringing, their, ask, their friend in Pittsburgh is coming and bringing to State College is October 20. It's a Sunday from 2 to 4.30 and then December 8th. And uh, when you go to the site that I sent out, uh, uh, it has all the things that you can buy. And they bring the glass things, the, the glass that you uh, apparently glue onto it. And it's be some beautiful projects on there, but it'd be a great Christmas gift. He said they just want to get people together uh, from the community. And he said, we will have Turkish tea and Turkish delights. Uh, so this guy that's coming was here for the iftar meal, that, and he did the um, calligraphy uh, that for people that were there. He did it for couples, and he did it for our church that's back, I think, downstairs. Uh, but it really sounds like a neat thing. There's 28 spaces available both times, I think, and I sent it to the uh, Baptist and Brethren Church to send out to their congregation, too. But, um, yeah, if you like crafts, or even if you don't, it, it sounds like a, a, a real fun time. Thank you. Any other announcements? Of course, there are announcements in the bulletin, and I call your attention to those. Um, our visitors, are there uh, any visitors who would like to uh, introduce themselves or their host and introduce them? Any visitors? Ah, yes. Hi, I'm Stephen Martin. Um, this is my wife Heidi. We um, we've been living in Wisconsin for the past seven years, and uh, as you know, that's a big battleground state. Trump and Harris are there about every week, so we thought it would be a good move to to uh, come back to Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> we um, we just bought a house here last week, and uh, the, we have an apartment out there. My my plan is to still work and, and shuttle back and forth. I'll be there quite a bit this, this fall. It's, it's a plan. It's probably a dumb plan, but it's a plan. Um, we'll see how long that lasts. But anyway, it's, it's good to see a lot of, of familiar faces and, and new faces. Well, thank you and welcome. It's wonderful to have you both with us today. Any other uh, visitors to introductions? If not, let's turn to birthdays. Birthdays to celebrate. No, ah, Leslie? Okay. So, um, I almost forgot for a minute. My birthday's Tuesday, October 1st. I'll be 75. Shocking number, of course. <laughs> Wonderful. Any other birthdays? Shall we fester with a song? Fester, I mean, <laughs> honor this birthday with a song. Jim, you want to start us on a little happy birthday? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Leslie. Happy 
And to anybody else who has a birthday that didn't want to announce it. Anniversaries? Any anniversaries? Okay. Well, uh, again, uh, so uh, thanks to everyone who participated in this uh, uh, our worship here today. And I would like to uh, close with this benediction. God of power, may the boldness of your spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your spirit lead us. May the gifts of your spirit be our strength now and always. Amen. Go in peace.